we played all sorts of games. We started from something very simple, a dictator game. And then we slowly evolved up to the trust game. Uh, we skipped one game in, in the middle where we was supposed to introduce a judge to the ultimatum game. Uh, but I think we'll, we'll get some more interesting stuff on this sort of thing today. Uh, judge is a bit like making stuff public or only the judge has the ability to punish you. So today we'll have uh, one level higher. Some of you already talked about this one level higher when you said things about prisoner's dilemma. Core summary, if you still don't remember or don't know what this is, you're welcome to uh, check this out. Um, to arrive here, I went through the, you know, my website teaching courses, went on this, opened the open science framework, and then went to force. If you want to see uh, uh, the slides and know everything that we're going to do in advance, you can go through here. Plus there's the class handouts and I'll give you the URL soon, or you can just find us on the open science framework, but everything is shared on the open science framework. So at any time that you feel like you wanna know more, go back, visit tutorials, videos, lectures, everything is there both from uh, this year and the previous year's tutorials. Another thing that you can do is it's on your syllabus. You can go to the other course the advanced social psychology to learn more about open science and why are we doing RRR assessment? What is this replication? What is this register report? Why are we doing all of that? Uh, I won't be going into that in detail here. Uh, you are here for judgment and decision making, um, but this will give you a hands-on experience looking at an original article, a classic in our literature to understand what is the methodology and methodological design and then see one of our replications. So uh, students like you who worked with me in previous semester or a thesis student that have done projects with me, just like the ones that you're going to do now. So in the next semester, somebody will be looking at your own um, projects and doing assessments for that. So this is how we have checks and balances from every uh, direction in order to increase the trustworthiness, uh, replication, reproducibility of our science. So this is the way that we get to know judgment and decision making. All right, um, for your RR assessment, we'll also make an additional announcement, but first of all, you have your syllabus. So go and make sure that you've read the syllabus. Uh, so the first RR assessment is a team project. So there's no use yet for the two groups, you're all working together. So Christy has assigned a Google Doc for you. Everything that we do is on Google Docs. It's very important that you work on those Google Docs. So don't make like a duplicate or don't uh, download this and work on that. Work on the Google Docs. This uh, allows us to, it allows us to uh, see who contributed what, to what extent, and also come at any given time to give you some help. Uh, if you're working on something on your own projects and you're thinking we're stuck, we don't know what to do with this, you can always tag us. So you add the strudel and then you add my email or your TA, the, TA, the assigned TA uh, that, to work with you. And then we'll come in and we'll, and we'll have a look. Uh, but of course, any question that you have at any time regarding this assignment, you can post on Slack. Uh, we have two tutorials from the previous semester by Christy and Kit. And then there's a tutorial on effect sizes. What is an effect size? How to calculate this? A lot of R code. You can go and have a look at that. Plus, if you want to know more about why we're doing this, what is the context and some case studies that we've discussed uh, in previous week in the other course, you can check that out. Uh, all the Google Docs that you have are based on a template that we've duplicated and assigned to you. So. You can also check that assessment. Plus, not only are you able to see everybody else's RRR assessment for this and the other course, so you can go and learn from your classmates as they're working on this, but you can also see our completed examples from previous years. For, so 2020, we had RRR assessments of our project, just like you're doing for my students uh, previous year. But in the first year, 2019, we actually did this on RRR that were published in the literature, so other people's replications. 
So we're both doing our applications and other people's replications. So you can go and check out both of these. And they've really improved. So those from 2020 looked at 2019 and uh, did uh, as good, but some of them really far exceeded everything beyond that. So today we're gonna to do session two of these game theory paradigms. We're going to increase complexity once again. So I know that in the first uh, session of the, the game theory, you're thinking, but what have we learned? You didn't tell us what the literature is saying. We just played some games and used our intuitions. How is this helpful for us? We want to go into the market, the industry and dominate using your tips on how to do better in the literature. We're not there yet. We're giving you some skills. The main purpose of us doing these games is to get you to put on the scientist hat to think how to design experiments, how to predict all sorts of things and to discuss the implications of that. So last week was the foundations for this week. And this week is going to be the foundation for next week, which is where I will start sharing some of the literature with you. Even today, I will show you some scientific articles, uh, which I find to be somewhat uh, interesting and uh, even funny about what we do. And we're going to play some simulations and games. I'll show you some really nice games that people designed online in order to get you some intuitions on how to use these games in real life, how to use these games when you collaborate as a group um, and when you do all sorts of interactions with other people, including myself, including the university. So there's all that. So th there is an, a handout. So this is the URL for the handout, or you can go on the open science framework. So you can just like punch this in mgto.org slash JDN week four, or uh, open this. There is no manipulation here. All of you have one version, so there's no need to no, overthink things. All of you have like the A on the top. <clears throat> okay. So open this kind of like in the background. And while you're opening this, um, don't have to do this just yet. I'm going to go through uh, a reminder and an elaboration of what we did last week. So we have this uh, Homo economicus uh, person who is 100% rational and focused on money as an incentive. So we know this person and uh, he represents the neoclassical economics model where everything is rational and everything is well known. There's some assumptions that we need to uh, discuss. All of these are kind of laid out here. Last week, I just presented the person and I let you assume everything that you want about this person. But the standard economics models assumes that everybody, everybody is fully aware of all the options that they have. So you can already think for every assumption, is this realistic or not? Do we really know all of the options that we have? So we assume all information is free. We assume that all of us are able to access the information. We assume that all of us are able to understand information and then that we are capable of making a choice among these things. I think every step of the way in this uh, sort of mega assumption, uh, could be shown uh, as false, according to a lot of things that we know about psychology. So we can discuss a lot of things about that. Um, people can always and consistently rank their options in according to their preferences. So not only can they choose the one that is preferred to them, but they can say this is the first, this is the second, this is the third. It's kind of like a very strong assumptions about people's ability to you know, process all that information. And then they will always choose the option uh, that they like best. Um, so we can think of all sorts of circumstances where we choose things uh, that we don't like to do. Perhaps the thing that we want to do right now is not be here and go play whatever, but uh, we're here because we have other goals in mind and other things that we would want to do, even if the other one perhaps is more uh, fun or uh, higher preference like but is more focused on short-term rather than long-term. Um, so all sorts of assumptions, uh, people act with full information, full knowledge, uh, both of the external environment and the internal of what it is that's uh, driving them. So the assumption is that people know their preferences. Do, do you know your preferences? Uh, I barely know what my preferences are and they seem to be shifting by the second. So do we have stable preferences? 
uh, are they stable over time, age, um, and different things that we encounter, and that there's this assumption of rationality that we choose the best option. So, so to introduce uh, all these things in a much more appealing way than me just uh, reading slides to you, I'm going to show you Dana Rielli. We've talked a little bit about Dan Ariely, but this is a person who you'll meet quite a lot uh, first this week. He has at least one more video, I think, coming up in the future. Uh, but he's, he's a prominent thinker and he's very good at communicating. So I think we have a lot of scholars that do good judgment and decision making research. But Dan Ariely is unique because he's also a good communicator. So whenever you do research, uh, I think the, one of the main challenges, even if you have amazing research, is how do you bring this to the public? How do you get people to you know, learn from what it is that you've studied and then implement this in their own lives? And uh, the first thing that he did, I think during his first sabbatical, so the nice thing about being an academic is that you work for six years and then you have one year, uh, the seventh year, where you get a sabbatical, um, the university basically pays you to go and do something meaningful. Could be all sorts of things. A lot of academics decide to write books. So Dana really wrote his first book, Predictably Irrational, which is a very good read, even if not uh, very updated. So it was from a while back. This landed him the TED Talk, which landed him a bunch of other things. And since then, six books after and a bunch of... Uh, successful startups and 200 people working for him at Duke University. He's one of the, the major uh, thinkers. And I think his appeal is really in bringing, you know, coming across to people in the field, practitioners, and of course, students like yourself, to be able to communicate very complex ideas of judgment decision-making very clearly. One more thing I want to say about Dan Ariely. Um, so a lot of interesting things. He brings his own experiences about what is pain, how to deal with pain, what is the right thing to do in medical circumstances into you know, uh, his research in judgment decision-making. So this is Dan Ariely. So, so what is behavioral? Uh, economics. Uh, behavioral economics is a discipline that is interested in the same question that economics is interested in, uh, but without assuming that people are rational. Okay? Now, in, in reality, many people think of behavioral economics as uh, being against classical economics. <clears throat> but a better way to think about it is not against, it's a compliment. Hello, I'm behavioral economics. And I'm standard economics. Isn't this a wonderful world that we live in? People are always making rational decisions all the time, not letting their emotions cloud their judgment, and always thinking about the future. I, I just don't see it this way. How can you see it this way? So the real goal of behavioral economics is to say, when you study economics, study economics. That's great. It's a wonderful thing. When you're studying sociology, study sociology. But when you come to policy, let's not just consider economics. Because while economics has some value, some explanatory power, it's not everything. So when it comes to policy, when you want to answer questions that society should care about, we should think about a broader range, a broader picture, a broader perspective that doesn't just include a rational person. We should also include what we know about human nature, which is that we are myopic and sometimes irrational and we have all these quirks in our behavior. We see stock bubbles. We see people overextending themselves on credit cards. We see people taking mortgages they shouldn't be taking. I just don't see where this rationality is coming from. But my model is so much cleaner. I have formulas and uh, algorithms and chi-squares and standard deviations. What do you have? I have experiments. I have experiments that tell us what we can do and can't do, how people actually make decisions, and what we're good at and when we are actually irrational. Economics, in some sense, is more optimistic about human nature because we're rational, we're thoughtful, we compute everything. And behavioral economics is a little bit depressing in the sense that we say people are myopic, easily confused, uh, have emotions, don't know what they want, uh, and so on. The, the silver lining in all of this is that in standard economics, there's nothing we can do to better the human condition, right? Because everything has already been done. We're like Superman of the mind. Superman? I think we're more like Homer Simpson of the mind. 
we make mistakes, we are confused, we can't think about the future, we fall in love, we're vindictive. There's all kinds of mistakes we make all the time. But the good thing about being Homer Simpson is that if we recognize where we are Homer Simpson, if we recognize where we make cognitive mistakes, where we fall short, we can actually think about how to improve the world. And that, for me, is again the, the kind of promise of behavioral economics, is to say let's kind of figure out where people don't behave perfectly, and let's try and think about crutches. Let's think about mechanisms to help them with those particular aspects, help us with those particular aspects. All right, good. So, a first introduction to uh, Dan Ariely holding his book, Predictably Rational, as in contrast to uh, the standard economics that has this suit and uh, talks with equations. A reminder about last, uh, last game, the last game that we uh, played was a trust game. Uh, if you recall, we had the player one that is given 100 Hong Kong dollars and then can give whatever sum they want out of the $100 to the other side. But whatever it is that they decide to give to the other side is being tripled. And then the person on the other side can uh, also decide how much they want to give out of that. So we had uh, this kind of uh, form, if you remember. Uh, first participant gave you 100 or 80 or 60 or 50. Uh, which means that this is what they currently have out of the 100. And then the experimenter, which is me, I triple this and give the second one either you know, from 100 turns into 300, so triple everything. And then the second participant, what do you want to allocate back, if anything at all? So a really interesting paradigm because it increases kind of like the complexity of uh, reciprocity. This is what you uh, did last time. So as participant one, what would the rational homo economicus give? You said 44.3, which is really interesting because it's exactly what the students in the last semester uh, gave. So very, very high consistency be uh, between the students. But it's interesting that out of the 300, you said that you'll give back 150 out of 240, uh, 116. So I tried to summarize this in an Excel because I know it was difficult to process. We're, we're Homer Simpson, so we can't really process very well, but Excel does this much better for us. And I actually uh, put both of these, from, so previous semester is down below and last week it's high above. One of you uh, already indicated that I did a mistake that I added. So the first person can only give a hundred, but I did the scale zero to 300 because I wanted to put all of these together. But what I did previous semester is I kind of, I limited this to zero to 100 because of the first question. So the main difference between those is not only that the different students, but also the scale in the first one was zero to 100. So you can see that in option A, they gave 100 out of the 100. So everybody gave everything. Um, but over here, out of the 300, you gave 150. The interesting thing, you can see a lot of interesting thing here. I don't know how, how easy it is to read all of this, but I think the left part, you definitely know. So how much the first person gives, how much they keep, and me tripling everything. And then in accordance to all of that, how much uh, at the end uh, player A and player B have. So the interesting thing is that you can see that player A, actually, it doesn't matter how much they give, they actually don't almost don't lose any money. So if you see over here, A is not, so you know, if, if they give 20 or they give 40, give 50, all, all of this is kind of like around the 100. So even if they give everything, they end up earning everything back. You were a little bit more generous, perhaps because of the scale than the previous semester, but you can see that if the per first person gives 100 or 80 or 60 or 50, at the end, they basically have 100 uh, or 150 to 100 for almost all of the options. Even in the options where they didn't give very much, like they gave 20, they still have at the end around, around 20. So they lost only uh, four, $4. Here they lost between four to five dollars. Uh, now you can see also that the ratio, it starts uh, with people uh, really give, giving a lot more money at the beginning, but it's slow, you know, the, the ratio for the player B slowly uh, decreases and you can see this decrease uh, uh, over time. So the two factors that we want to look at is uh, the combined um, of how, both, how much both of them 
give together. So of course the maximum pot is three, 300. So when the first person gives 100, it's tripled, so it's 300. So the maximum is of course here and it decreases the less the first person gives. But there's also kind of like, uh, you can see how the, the player B reacts in accordance uh, to that. And it's pretty amazing to see that player B, you, rarely punishes player A for what it is that they do. So basically, you all keep player one uh, happy. Even if they gave 20, there's very little punishment that by giving them zero, you still gave him about 15. Uh, actually, you gave them exactly what the students from previous semester gave. So you gave them 16, even though they already had like 80, so 80 plus 16. So they only penalized by four, which is not a very big uh, penalty. So it's really interesting the way that player B reacts to player A, because we would have assumed that, you know, in a social interaction, we would punish the, the, the first one for not, for not allocating much, but we don't really do that because generally we're, we're, we're nice people. Uh, even if the, the, the player A is not somebody that we know, and this is how we tend to behave here. So afterwards, you can go back and have a look at this and see if you have any interesting insights and what kind of hypothesis you have as a scientist. So for me, it's really interesting. Rather than just you know, trying to get some insights in the classroom, it's very difficult to process all this information. So what is the ratio and what is the combined and uh, did he lose or didn't he lose? But then afterwards, I go and I plot everything. I put this into the Excel. I also compare this to the previous semesters. And then I try to see, did I gain any insights? from this kind of game, and then how could I make it even more, more interesting? So previous semester, this is how they answered this. So when I asked them, please rank this, uh, they said the most um, common one is the trust game followed by the ultimator game, followed by the public dictator game. Not really sure what that's about, but the dictator game, the dictator game is the least um, common of all of these games. So it seems like not only have we increased in complexity, we've also increased in realism. So it seems like the more we incorporate into these games, the more realistic it becomes. All right, so now it's time for us to go to our handouts. Now we uh, increase complexity. We've uh, went back, saw the trust game. We now understand what is behavioral economics thanks to Dan Ariely. Now we can go into prisoner's dilemma. So I'll ask you to go over experiment A. Let me try and open this here and I'll show you what this is about. So in experiment A, we have the very classic prisoner's dilemma. Two criminals have been arrested on a suspicion of a serious crime. The police have found contraband on each of them that would uh, lead to lesser charges. But in order to convict the two in a serious crime, they need a con uh, confession for the serious crime. The two criminals are being detained in separate rooms, have no knowledge of what the other person is saying. The possible outcomes are summarized as follows. Now we have two versions, version uh, one and version two. It says, if you're one of those players playing against a classmate, somebody here, and I will try to match you together randomly. So I ask that you punch in your preferences and then I'll ask you, what did you uh, punch in? So in version, in version one, if player one cooperates, doesn't confess, player one defects, player two cooperates, player, player two uh, defects. And you can see that cooperation leads to both of them receiving one year. Uh, mutual defection leads to either five years in version one or two years in version two. And then if one person defects and the other cooperates, then the person who defects gets freedom when the, um, the person who cooperates actually gets uh, 10 years or three years. So have a look at this uh, payoff. And then I'm asking you for version one and version two, would you cooperate or would you defect? Then the question that I have for you is, did you answer differently for version one and version two and why? And then what do you think the homo economicus strategy here is so if you're an economist and you follow all the assumptions that we uh, went through what would you choose here and then what do you think most people would do okay so given that this is somebody random that i'm going to choose here and you don't know who that person is and you need to choose whether to cooperate or defect what is your main answer okay so we have four of you and before we we discuss um the actual results Let's have your predictions. What do you think will happen 
in this case? What do you think your classmates would be? Let's start from the homo economicus. You know what? What, what would the homo economicus do here? What is the rational thing to do? Okay, so homo economicus uh, defect on version one, uh, which is different from version two. Yeah. Okay. Uh, agree with this? No, so, I think there are only defect on both. Defect on both? Okay. I don't think the scale really changes anything. Okay. So we'll we'll come back to why you think uh, the version two is going to be defect. Do do you agree that the homo economicus, the rational thing to do here, is defect? Thing. Preventing the most loss. Yeah. And that would explain why in version uh, two you think it would be it might be might be different. Yeah. Okay, good. Actually, there is a Nobel Prize waiting for you if you get this, because somebody who figured this out received the Nobel Prize and even a Hollywood movie after him. Which a beautiful mind. Oh, well, what's his name? I forgot. <laughs> oh, okay. Have you watched? How many of you watched the movie? Beautiful Mind, yeah? Well, he's schizophrenic. Yeah, the guy, the guy, the schizophrenic. Anything else you know about him? Nash, the Nash Equilibrium. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is, so he's one of the first who modeled uh, uh, an interaction where there's other people and whether you cooperate or you don't cooperate. He's, do you remember from the movie what his insight was? He almost killed his child. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah. I don't think that's what he got the Nobel Prize for. Okay, okay. So what did he get the, so what, what, is, what is the equilibrium? What, what does it mean? So he was trying to say, what would the rational person do? What did he find? It's a little bit, it's kind of like following a little bit of your logic. So you could have, if, if you were just born 70 years ago, you could have like uh, headed towards the, uh, what, what do you, what, so your logic is a little bit different. You said both of them defect. What's your logic? Maybe you're closer to the Nobel Prize. No, I'm... What was your, lo I'm trying to ask, what was your logic by saying that they're defecting? Yeah. Um, I think that perhaps uh, is the same as Nash's. By defecting, that's the only way you're going to get complete freedom. So ah. that's the ultimate uh, goal, right? To get complete freedom. And let's say. Uh, but but wait, just, let's just clarify when you say complete freedom, you mean? Zero year. No, what do you mean zero year? That's what it says, freedom, right? Like no jail time. Oh, freedom, no jail time. That's what you mean? <laughs> what, what? Okay, okay. So he's looking at the loss and you're looking at the. No, freedom could be the freedom to choose. That's oh, how I interpret oh, it. Oh, oh, you say fair. freedom from jail. Yeah, so yeah, you're yeah. looking at the loss and you're looking at the possible. Yes, exactly. Okay. So, so it's different from his in what way? In that, his is more focused on uh, negativity bias and loss aversion. So and you're like, what's the highest chances for me to not spend any time here, yes. any time in jail? And okay. also, like, um, so if we both cooperate, we both have to spend one year. But, like, if I don't know that person, mm. like, I don't care about whether he gets 10 years or five years. Mm. So of course I'm going to defect, you know, if I'm a jerk. That's the whole thing. That's, okay. that's all I answer. But yeah, homo economicus is not, being, is not worried about being a jerk. It's, it's not a big problem for the homo economicus. The, he wants to be right. But a lot of the times being totally rational, quote unquote rational, it's about, it's actually very exploitative of human nature. So could I be. think that's kind of a- But it could also like a bon a fire back, right? Bounce back at you. Economicus wouldn't even care if he got five years. I mean, it's a, it's a risk worth taking. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. So we have like two different strategies. So you kind of like agree and come to the same conclusion in version one, but in version two, that's where you kind of deviate. Is there any other way of looking at this? this yes, please. Uh -huh. Five years in prison, and yeah. I believe that the player one will do that. Uh, then my best interest is also to do that because it's like five years versus ten years, so I end up doing that. And for if I'm player one, the result will generate will be exactly the same. Right. For the version two, if we do the analysis in the same way, I end up cooperation. If I'm mm -hmm. Very good. So keep in mind these three strategies and we'll come and visit uh, this and I'll tell you which one is the closest to the Nobel Prize. So uh, in version one, uh, most of you decided to defect 
which is interesting. <laughs> is this in accordance with your predictions? Okay, so without going into too much detail, how does having a second round influenced by the first round? What, what is the change between having a one-off and having two iterations? Okay. C can you elaborate a little bit? So yeah. if the person uh, cheats, uh, I mean, the white the defect, defect, yes. The first round, yeah. Then you could be sure that, that that person probably won't cooperate with the second round. Uh, expect as well to like, protect yourself and, and, and prevent yourself from getting that next round. Okay. I'm sure, though. Let's say if if I see that he's defected in the first round, I, I would cooperate with it. Around, and then he might see that, oh, I cooperated, and he might change his option. Uh, the so what was missing in his answer? And then you are saying that I, I would change to definite defect. Yeah, so you were focused on what you saw on the other side. And you're saying, I also was there. Mm -hmm. I also acted in a certain way, and I am signaling all sorts of stuff. So perhaps he defected, I cooperated. In that case, what would happen in the second, in the second one? So like... Uh, so what would according, the, according to his interpretation, it means that the person would reject again, right? Yes, yes. You're, you're saying in this kind of case, what would happen? I'm saying that the other person might see that, oh, that person would like to cooperate. Mm. I don't also want to cooperate. But that kind of logic can also stack, right? So it, it's okay. an infinite loop, like it's, it's basically a very complicated version of rock, paper, scissors. Exactly, yeah. That's why, why is it rock, paper, scissors? It, it's just an example, but it's like I'm, I'm predicting what you'll do, and you're predicting what I'm predicting I'll do, and based on that, I'll do something, and then just keep on. Doesn't that on. just blow, blow your mind? We're going to do a simulation of this endless round. I, I didn't think that it would sound like it would be But it sound, right? sounds like it doesn't change your view of what might happen. What do you think is going to happen? Uh, depends heavily on what the person is. Probably extremely complicated. Yeah, okay. Um, so let's try, I know, let's leave the complexity aside. Give me two types of strategy. What kind of strategies do you have? You're saying if the person defects, I defect. Is that a strategy? If the first, if the first, if the person defected in the first round, I'm going to defect in the second round, right? That's a copycat strategy. Oh, we're using fancy. Yeah, okay, good. We'll, we'll, come, we'll come to this. Okay. Which game did you play? The... Oh, you play? Okay, we're going to show this. Yeah, it's yeah. a wonderful game. I, I, saw the... Saw the... I saw the icons, yeah. I, I know the... the... Yeah, it's, it's, it's terrific. Good. Copycat. Um, any other strategies? I, I remember the strategy depends on the situation. Don't, don't do a, that them, Can you just share with me another strategy before you tell them what the strategy is? Did you want a certain pattern for one and then modify your strategies based on that. I think, I think there was something along that line. That I thought. You're trying to remember what others are, are saying about this, but I'm asking what, what, is, what, is, what are you saying about this? What kind of strategies do you see that you can do here? Let's try and simplify this. Don't tell me which one is the most optimal. I'm just saying, give me a strategy. Okay, always cheat first, unless the other person cooperates, then you cooperate. Okay, give me one. Okay, you give me one. How would, what would you call this? If you good, good, I good, good. <laughs> Perfect. I Terrific. I like this strategy very much. Good. If you good, good, I good, good. Okay, yes. Perfect. Other strategies? Predict other ones. What we'll do and then how. We'll Predict do. how? You had the first round. What would you do with it? And maybe if we see I defect, then I think he will also defect. Then I'll, because he will defect after seeing I defect, then I'll defect afterwards. <laughs> Let, let's try and simplify this. Give, give me like a simple rule. If then. I think the end up will become. Okay, yes, please. Oh, very interesting. Cooperation until the person defects. When they defect once, then. From then on. Okay, you defect until they start cooperating. Okay, interesting. What would you call this? Nice guy or nice girl. Huh? 
trying to be nice. Oh, I like this title. Very good title. Oh, Terrific. You, always you? Oh, okay. Always defect. <laughs> or you're, you're optimizing. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, good. So we have a few strategies over here and we'll, we'll give them names that you already know. Any other things that you want to, uh, any other strategies? You can yeah. Randomizer. Good. Very good. Anything else? Okay, so before we go into all of that, I'm going to show you a series of mind games that you're like, I'm going to predict, he's going to predict, I'm going to predict. So we're going to do with a TV show called Golden Bowls. Have you heard of, of that? You've, you've watched some of that? You've not? Uh -huh. You have? So very entertaining. Before I show you that, I'm going to show you one video. We'll take a break and then we'll come back for Golden Bowls. So I'm going to show you about the Nash Equilibrium. Probably the most famous thought experiment in competitive game theory is the prisoner's dilemma. The prisoner's dilemma describes a game, a social interaction, that involves two prisoners. We'll call them Wanda and Fred. Wanda and Fred were arrested, fleeing from the scene of a crime, and based on the evidence the police have already collected, they are going to have to spend two years in jail. But the DA wants more, so he offers them both a deal. If you confess to the crime and your partner does not, you will be granted immunity for cooperating. You'll be free to go. Your partner, though, will serve 10 years in jail. If you both confess and dish up loads of dirt about each other, then you will both end up spending five years in jail. But if neither of you confess, you will both spend only two years in jail. Those are their options. Then Wanda and Fred are split up. They don't know what their partner is going to do. They have to make their decisions independently. Now, Wanda and Fred, they've, they've had some wild times stealing diamonds or whatever, but they don't have any special loyalty to each other. They're not brother and sister. They're hardened criminals. Fred has no reason to think that Wanda won't stab him in the back and vice versa. Competitive game theory arranges their choices and their potential consequences into a grid that looks like this. If both Wanda and Fred choose not to confess, they'll both serve two years. In theory, this is the best overall outcome. Combined, they would spend as little time in prison as possible. But that immunity sounds pretty good. If one of them chooses to confess and the other one doesn't, the snitch gets to walk, then the math looks like this. That's the problem. Wanda and Fred have no reason to trust each other. Wanda might consider not confessing because if Fred doesn't confess either, both only serve two years. If they could really trust each other, that would be their best bet. But Wanda can't be sure that Fred won't snitch. He has a lot to gain by confessing. If he does decide to confess and she keeps silent, she's risking 10 years in jail well, he goes free. Compared to that, the five years they both get for turning on each other doesn't sound so bad. And that is game theory's solution. They should both confess and rat each other out. So right now you're thinking, wow, game theory is a jerk. But it actually makes sense. That square in the grid where they both confess is the only outcome that has reached what's known as Nash Equilibrium. This is a key concept in competitive game theory. A player in a game has found Nash Equilibrium when they make the choice that leaves them better off no matter what their opponents decide to do. If Wanda confesses and Fred does not confess, she's better off. She gets to walk. By confessing, she went from serving two years in prison to serving none. If Fred does confess, she's still better off. If she kept her mouth shut, she'd be spending 10 years in prison. Now, she only has to serve five. Sure, if she decides not to confess and Fred keeps his pinky promise too, they'll both get out in two years, but that is an unstable state because Wanda can't trust Fred. She doesn't know what he's going to do. This is not a cooperative game. All of the players stand to gain from stabbing each other in the back. The Prisoner's Dilemma is just one example of a competitive game, but the basic idea behind its solution applies to all kinds of situations. Yeah, so which, which one of you gets the Nobel Prize? You're kind of close to it, right? Yeah, very good. You just assume that they will confess. And then so if I... And then... Okay, yeah, good. You already raised a few things about the factor whether this is the shared crime and your accomplices or whether this is a different crime. So you can think about all sorts of variations of this game, uh, what is confession. But I'm not really sure why they use prisoner's dilemma. Why is this called a prisoner's dilemma? They could have used all sorts of other ways to look at this. Why do they have to be prisoners at all? And there's something very confusing about here. What is cooperation and what is defection? Well, there's the confession and not confessing. Who are you cooperating with? Are you cooperating with the person or are you co cooperating with 
the, the police. So I just think prisoner's dilemma is just a very confusing thing for uh, this paradigm. But I think if we look at the, uh, the grid, the payoffs, things become a little bit uh, clearer. Now, an amusing paper that came out in 2003 said, we don't know why it's called prisoner's dilemma, but if it's called a prisoner's dilemma, don't you think that we should talk to prisoners? <laughs> so they went to talk to prisoners. So they looked at students versus prisoners and say, instead of asking students, what would you do if you're a prisoner? How about you just ask prisoners? And what you can see over here is that on the left, you can see the uh, sequential versus simultaneous uh, split between the students. So if it's a sequential, you know, you have one turn after the other. And you can generally see, and this is pretty amazing, that prisoners tend to cooperate a lot more than students do. <laughs> So brilliant paper, sometimes you ask yourself, well, so we discuss with the Asian disease, like why is this called Asian? That's such a bad naming for this. And prisoners dilemma is such a bad name for such an important game theory paradigm. And then somebody says, maybe we should just look at what the name actually says. And then looking at prisoners and their dilemma, uh, brilliant stuff. The cooperation rate among inmates exceeds the uh, rate of cooperating students. Students and inmates behave identically as second uh, movers. Hence, we find similar and significant fraction of inmates and students to hold social preferences. So a lot more people uh, cooperate, especially uh, people like prisoners, who you don't really expect to cooperate very much in order to... Um, so they're more social, but a very specific kind of social circle. So classmates, you between yourselves and prisoners, and then you can compare, compare the two and take this to other contexts. All right, so we'll take a 10 minute break. We'll come back and then we'll see some TV shows about uh, how you predict others who are going to predict you, uh, how you're going to predict them, and so forth. So, time to continue. I really like Golden Balls uh, because it captures the delicate details of the interaction in the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, we'll start from the second one, then we'll move to the first one, then we'll come back to the second one. The second one, I just, I'm going to start with it. So this will explain the rules. Okay, wait, wait, wait. This will explain the rules of the game of golden balls. Then I'm going to pause it, go back to the first one, and then uh, come back to this game. Welcome back to golden balls. After a run of big cash balls, Ibrahim and Nick now have 13,600 pounds in front of them. We know they've got it, but the golden question is, can they keep it? Ibrahim and Nick, you now face a very straightforward choice, but it's a choice that could make one or both of you extra wealthy, but it could also lose both of you everything that you have fought for today. They have to decide to split or steal. Ibrahim, Nick, you have two final golden balls in front of you, and they are the most important golden balls of the game. You each have a golden ball with the word split written inside. You both have a ball with the word steal written inside. You will know which is split and which is steal because you're going to have a look. If you both pick the split ball, you split the 13,600 and you go home with 6,800 each. If one of you chooses the steel ball and the other chooses the split ball, whoever chooses the steel ball goes home with the whole lot, 13,600. But if you both choose the steel ball, you leave today's game with what you came with, nothing. It's the ultimate test of faith, trust, and let's face it, greed. Take a moment to look at the balls in front of you so you know for definite which is split and which is steel, but obviously keep them concealed from each other. Just have a look. Okay, 
It's the easiest choice, but the most difficult one. What I want you to do is to spend half a minute talking to each other. Okay, so he explained the rules of the game. Is everybody clear on the rules of the game? It's pretty simple. It's a very simple version of Prisoner's Dilemma. Um, and then they know, of course, which ball, and then they need to show the ball at the same time, and then both of them get, get the result. Uh, and then they have, unlike the Prisoner's Dilemma, where in the separate rooms, here they see one another, and he gives them some time to coordinate. Now, your predictions of not in the, in the... So they're strangers. They don't know one another. This is their first round of engaging one another. What do you think is the strategy here? What do you think is going to happen in this one? What do you expect? Cooperate, defect, both win, both lose. Both, both will still and get zero. Okay. Any other predictions? That's good. Thank you. Cooperate. Both of them cooperate. So so, I've seen the video title and I've watched the video before. I think. Okay. <laughs> so you're always trying to remember what it is that you're. Okay. So I'm going to show you this to you. To me, this is the most brilliant ever. This is an amazing way to deal with the prisoner's dilemma, which I think most people don't know. But before I show you this, I'm going to show you a different one. Sorry? With, with which idea? Wait, wait, before you tell me this, I'm going to show you one more because I want you to see the kind of interactions that you might have. But good, I, I, want, I want clever ideas. Now, in this interaction, the woman, uh, this is already, they've had an interaction before. So they already had a sense of knowing the other person. And she is very, very worried. Before I ask you to choose. That he is going to cheat her again. So he has a reputation of defecting. And now let's see how she deals with it. What do you see in their facial expressions? What do you see? Any observations? Yeah? Because he cheated before. Yes. So she does not trust him at all. Uh -huh. Because the worst scenario is just they have nothing. Uh -huh. Both of them get nothing. Right. So I think the girl was too still with. Okay. Yeah. What what did you make of her facial expressions after she she did this? Okay. Based on the expression and the before the, the talking part is more like a fling on the show to convince the other part not to steal again. Yeah. Yeah, she, she did a really good performance in getting the other person to feel so guilty about what he did in previous round. It's a little bit like uh, what we discussed before, in order to get what it is that she wanted to do, which is a little bit like payback and revenge over this, right? So a really interesting interaction. Does this relate to your uh, method strategy or you had something else? I have a question about actually open the ball. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if the rules are, but... Open no, the ball. you can't. You need to hold this. Okay. But given that you need to predict what the other person will predict about you, and both of you need to make a lot of calculations, what is the best way to do this? So I want to show you something ingenious. About what you both should do. Nick, Abraham. Abraham, I want you to um, trust me. 100% I'm going to pick the steel ball. Sorry, you're going to... I'm going to choose the steel ball. You're going to take the I steel. want you to do split, and I promise you that I will split the money with you. Well, after you've took the steel? Yeah. You're going to take steel? Yeah. I'm going to take split? Yeah. So you take the money... And I will split it with you. ...after the show? Yeah. <laughs> so what is he doing here? He's trying, a bit like you, trying to change the rules of the game by keeping the game, by doing something additional to that. So... Do you think this is going to work or not? Sorry? Okay, let's see how this unfolds. Abraham, I promise you I'll do that. If, if, if you do steal, we both walk away with nothing. I'm telling you 100% no, I'm going to do it. I appreciate that. Right, I'll give you another alternative. Why don't we just both pick 
split. I'm not going to pick split. I'm going to steal, Ibrahim. Honestly, 100% going to steal. It's in your nature to steal. No, I, I'm honest, and I'm going to tell you're, you... You're an honest I am. That's why I'm telling you I'm going to steal. If you do split, then I will I split the money. I can't see myself doing that. OK, well, I'm going to steal, so we're going to leave with nothing. Where's your brains coming from? <laughs> I can't work out... I know that I'm a decent guy and I will split the money with you. Well, we should just both split then. No, I'm going to do steal. There is no legal no, I know, requirement I know there is. I know there for is. him to give you the of money. Of course. If I gave you my word... Now, let me, let me tell you what my word means. OK. My father once said to me, a man who doesn't keep his word is not a man. He's not worth nothing. Not worth a, not worth a dollar. I agree. So... Abraham, I'm going to steal. So you've got the choice. You either steal and we both walk away with nothing. Because you know, I've told you my intention and I've told you that I will split the money with you, Abraham. If I gave you my word that I was going to split, I would split. And you're going to take steal, so... The only way you can guarantee to walk away with 6,800... ..is by ..is sharing. to guarantee that you both put the split ball in. And I do now have to push you for a decision. It's a tough one. We've lost it. We've lost everything. OK. We've lost then. We're walking away with no money because you're an idiot. No, that's you're not You're an true. idiot. You're an idiot. That's what you are. You're an idiot. You're an idiot. That's what you are. We, we, this can go on all night and these people have got to get up for breakfast. <laughs> Nick, choose split or steal. Ibrahim, choose split or steal. Now, please. Choose a ball. Right, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go with you. OK. <laughs> I'm going to go with I you. I promise you I will split it. You cannot change your balls now. Split or steal? Yes! Congratulations, you have both split and each received £6,800. Pounds. Why did you put me through that? Why did you do it to me? So what did he do here? Mm. And so it would actually, you, you can actually, I think, pursue both of them more because the end result is going to take those both split the money. Mm. But the most important part is that the money doesn't stay with the show, it goes to either one of them or both of them. And the, the, the money goes Why did he need all this elaboration if he decided to split at the end? Was it what he was yelling at him? Why did you have make me go through all of that? So, what is the answer to that? What, what is the strategy here? Basically, convincing the other person. Yeah, not, not just convincing, basically forcing well, them. Convincing, but giving them a sort of equilibrium status where splitting is actually uh, the logical or rational thing to do. Yeah. So a really interesting strategy. So whenever there's a game of cooperation, one of the ways that you can gain is by trying to think what is the possible way for you in order to force the other person to do something and then even if you have the best intentions, like split, he wanted to split. He could have taken the whole thing, right? But he decided to split. Uh, but he basically ensured that the other person is going to uh, split as well. So I think you, we've seen a few of the instances in this course about how, you know, I came in offering to give you 100, 100 Hong Kong dollars, knowing that I'm going to gain from that. Sometimes just by knowing the rules of the game and thinking about this in advance and knowing and predicting what others are going to do and how they're going to behave with all sorts of uh, strategies, you can get the other person to do something that will also benefit you, will also benefit them. Yeah, of course. Did the game show end after this episode aired? What do you mean? Is this the, the last one? Yeah, yeah. No, it went on for a very long time. Why? You, you want to you wanna enroll or what? No, 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 I'm just like curious. Like, so if someone found like a really good strategy, Oh, so that's a good question. What do you think would happen if this would be run again and somebody would try this? I was like considering the potential of like both players trying to force the other player to do this mm. kind of thing. Yeah. And I was like, I was thinking, so then maybe they both, you know, what they're trying to do. Yeah. So do you, do you think this is a one off strategy or this can uh, repeat again in others? Yeah, you'll flip again. Yeah, you'll just flip again again. It's the whole, yeah, it's the whole thing. 
Yeah. Very good question, because it, this brings me to this article. Why am I showing you golden balls in the judgment decision making academic scientific class where we discuss findings? I want to show you that we sometimes do articles on golden balls. So they've actually analyzed, they've taken all of the golden balls that have ever been done and analyzed the rates of cooperation, the differences between men and women, the kind of strategies that people did back and forth. Fascinating stuff. I know this guy, we communicate on Twitter. And when I saw that this is the stuff that he did his, uh, his research on, uh, I was just uh, blown, blown away. There's also like a big name here. So Richard Tyler is the um, Nobel Prize winner economist from 2017. And what you can see here, lots of really interesting st stuff like cooperation is surprisingly high. People seem to cooperate. Uh, we, we saw one instance at, at the end over there. Um, they identify something called a big peanuts uh, phenomenon. I'll show you in a second what that means. But also, uh, players do not seem to be likely to cooperate if their opponent might be expected to cooperate. So there's all sorts of mind games. Further, we replicated earlier findings that males are less cooperative than females. But this gender effect reverses for older contestants because men become increasingly cooperative as the age increases. So if you're thinking, how are we going to study prisoner's dilemma in real life settings? TV shows, that's one way of doing it. So I think that's brilliant. But when you're thinking, OK, I'm watching this TV show. There's not much that I can learn from this. Actually, we learn a lot from this because we can aggregate many, many instances of this show running for a very long time. And then you can see, for example, uh, cooperation. So if the stake size up to 100,000, cooperation rate really decreases. So at low stakes, this is the big peanuts. At low stakes, people cooperate because it's not a big deal. But on the high stakes, it seems to reduce slightly uh, lower than the 50% cooperation rate. So that's really interesting uh, way of looking at this. But also if you're interested in demographics, so individual differences, males versus uh, females. So this phenomenon, so the males are the darker one, females are so you can actually see the rates of cooperation uh, among those uh, with the different ages. So really interesting uh, stuff over there. Now, oh yes, please. Yeah. Yes, a lot of things are very different. Yeah, a lot. I've seen people uh, analyze Sur Survivor. I've seen people analyze Amazing Race. I've seen people, obviously, a lot of funny things going on over there. And they know that the cameras are on there. Uh, they have a lot of incentives because of the grand prize. And they also know that beyond this grand prize, they have other things like home, how they're going to be evaluated, whether they become celebrities or not. So true, we still like this because we do this. And then other people do other things and then we can compare them to see what are the differences and maybe we can quantify what is the value of having a public audience or having this pressure or having this structure. So the more that we can do on what's available as a data set, both in simulations like that in a TV show or in reality, then we can see consistency, how robust is this effect. But you're very right that it's very difficult to generalize from here to what would people do in their in real life situations. Well, another issue with those kind of TV shows is that they usually like manipulate so that the the yeah. contestants that are more popular with the audience yes. stay yeah. for longer. Yeah. So the TV, the TV in Golden Balls and Survivor and Amazing Race, they manipulate a lot of factors in there, which we don't have any control over, but we can code. So a lot of the coders actually put this into what you can observe, what you can see, not the stuff that you know from, you know, behind the scenes, but you code the kind of interventions and then you see whether this has an influence or not. So whenever we do a mega study, meta study, we can code all sorts of influences, uh, even things like what day of the week is it, what month of the year, or, you know, all sorts of uh, things that they've changed in the way that they've manipulated the settings between the two people. But definitely they're looking for what, what, what a TV show is looking for, ratings, right? They want to increase the ratings. So, yeah. When I saw this on Twitter, I thought that was absolutely brilliant. I was hoping to do this on you uh, in the classroom, but uh, <laughs> the ethics uh, uh, approval is not easy to gain for this kind of thing. Uh, but this is, this is what somebody ran. 
you each earn some extra credit on your term paper. You get to choose whether you want two points added to your grade or six points, but there's a catch. If more than 10% of the class select six points, then no one gets any points. All selections are anonymous and the course grades are not curved. So you can choose how much bonus points you want. You want two or you want six, but if there's more 10% that want six rather than two, then nobody gets anything. What is, what is your response? What do you think would happen with this kind of setup? Sorry? No one gets anything, why? Yeah. You will choose the two. But it's not just about you specifically. You need to come to a 90% at least you're getting to. Yeah. Why is it so hard? Also, when we did the bidding, it was kind of hard to get everybody to, right? Getting people to cooperate, even in a classroom where we all see each other and we have iterated you know, exposure. We get to, we work together in teams and then we, we share things. I like the Twitter reactions to this. One professor's final exam went viral. And then what kind of a professor does this? And then somebody replies, I am that professor. <laughs> so, I like this kind of thing. Plus you have a lot of replications. So I've actually used this problem to get my students to wrestle with individual rights versus common good. I've been doing this in my classes for years now and used almost the same thing in a quiz. They still failed, they all get so what you said about them failing seems to happen again and again. So I'll show you how one professor wanted to find a solution to this. He wanted to know what can I do in order to get all of you to cooperate. And look how he gave them a few opportunities. And he even did something very extreme. And look at what happened there uh, in, as a result. So if everyone chooses collude, all the students get 10 bonus points on their final exam. If everyone chooses to collude, but uh, one person defects, that person gets one person defects, that person gets 50 bonus points on the final exam and no other students gets any points. If more than one person chooses to defect, no student receives any bonus points. And these are real bonus points, not pretend. There are 550 students in the class and they have eye clickers. This is how they vote. So this is the first vote. It'd be nice to have 10 points in the exam. It'd be nice to have 10 points, huh? The problem is that 50 is much better than 10. Can you see what happened? <laughs> so you've got 36 over here that decided to, um, <laughs> to go for the 50 points. And this is more than one, therefore nobody gets anything. So about 7%. You guys want to do it again? Yeah, sure. All right. Uh, you want to talk among yourself or something before you do it? Or you just want to go for it? Right? Better, you convinced four people to collude, right? That was, uh, that was an improvement. Um, you want to do it again? Yeah. How to solve this? He's going to ask him for One thing before we do it, anything? Yes? Yeah? Well, yeah, we, okay. You want, some people here want people to go for A. What do you want? What? Did you catch that? He told them to trade the clickers with somebody else. So they're not even holding their own clickers anymore. Let's, ah. let's see what happens. Pass your clicker. Here's suggested that we pass your clicker to the next person and see if that works. <laughs> Would that work? Uh, no, because why? <laughs> <laughs> Wanna try that? Yeah. Right, let's try, let's try. So you don't have to try, but uh, make sure you, you keep track of who you're giving it to, right? So if you want, why don't you trade clickers with the person next to you? 
Try clicker with a person next to you. You can pass your clickers. Um, now, if you pass your clicker, there's no reason why you should defect now. So, the choice, the chances, I think, should have been a little better, right? Oh. Yeah. So I think still 11 people, was it 11? 11, yeah. So, yeah, so and not just one person, like 11 people still, even if it's not their own clickers, they choose to, to defect in this kind of uh, situation. So some fun stuff that you can do with this, uh, but it really shows a lot of stuff about human nature. So when the situation is extreme, and you have a very large group of people, not just another person, but when you increase the pool, so you can already think of all sorts of research questions that you can pose on how many people are involved in this kind of, in this kind of dilemma. So uh, fun stuff. Game of trust, this is the one that you were talking about. Okay, so we're going to show you well, what- Another way to solve that of this problem yeah. Do you think that's going to work? I think that will work. Though. I don't have to say that will work. But, you know, like, so it, it's like it's such a big group. There's one person that just wants to be an asshole because they're an asshole. And I'll just take it just to piss everybody else off, right? Because, well, you, you just say, it, 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 in a case of like 550 people, it's the, the, the kind of temptation where you click one button and annoy 550 people. That's not, that's not really a kind of opportunity you might get. Like, maybe 99% of people won't take that opportunity. But, in such a big group, there's like those 11 people, there's probably like, I mean, maybe, I'm maybe five or six who will take that opportunity and piss everybody off because why not? It's fun. Maybe if the situation is slightly different, it's like if that port is actually really hard and the port is actually changed quite a lot, and uh -huh. everyone is on the borderline of failing, <laughs> and then you do that experiment. I'm pretty sure most people will block it. Okay, good. So hopefully when you become a professor, you can uh, do similar things. Yeah. Okay, don't, don't forget this when you become big and famous. Okay. So the evolution of trust, uh, somebody that's really good uh, um, web designer decided to take prisoner's dilemma and show what happens in society on multiple iterations. So we're not going to do the whole game. It takes half an hour, but I really encourage you to do this. It's fun. You learn a lot from this. You get to predict and put the scientist uh, uh, hat. It's, it's really terrific. I'm just going to show you the, the first part. I also support Nikki on Patreon. I think she's an amazing one. Um, so. <clears throat> game of trust you have one choice in front of you there's a machine if you put one coin in the machine the other player gets three coins and vice versa you can both choose either to cooperate or cheat let's say that the other person cheats and doesn't put in a coin what what should you do what would you do exactly why let the moocher mooch off of you if you cooperate and they cheat, you lose a coin and then they gain three. However, if you both cheat, neither of you gain or lose anything. Score zero, zero, therefore, you should not cheat. But you can see the kind of trade-off that they're talking about over here is a bit different. But let's say that the other person cooperates, what would you put? Right? Sure, seems like the right thing to do. Or is it? Because both of you cooperate, you both give up a coin to gain three. But if you cheat and they cooperate, you gain three coins. Good music and everything but i feel like i need to shout therefore you should still cheat hmm. how about more than once now let's play for real you'll be playing against five different opponents each with their own game strategy so you came up with at least uh, four over here right with each opponent you'll play anywhere between th three to seven rounds can you trust them or rather can they trust you the first one real move choose wisely what was your uh, strategy that you said before what should I do here? Pick your first first real move. What should you do? Your, yours was quite simple. What, what did you say? Okay, so cooperate. Okay, let's go with this. Pretty straightforward. Okay, so two, two, keep cooperating, right? It should be working, right? A 
second opponent. We'll keep doing this, okay? Cooperate. Can I keep cooperating? I'm saying from now on, cheat. And then what's the next one? <laughs> Let's keep on cheating. Another one. How about here? Cooperate. Sorry, you were saying? Okay. Yeah. For the next one, we'll do it. Okay. Okay. Okay, we'll start with cheating then. Keep cheating. So what did this opponent do? A little bit like what she did, right? First cooperated, then you started cheating, and then they cheated, right? Okay, what to do here, the last one? Cheat all the way? Sorry, how many cheats? Cheat, cooperate, cheat, cooperate. Okay, so here we have the different characters that we've just faced, so you get to learn about them. So we've had the copycat that you already know. So I start to cooperate, and afterwards I just copy whatever I did in the last round. You did in the last round, sorry. Always cheat. So we've had like uh, the always cheat strategy. We had the always cooperate strategy. Uh, the grudger, listen, partner. I'll start cooperating and keep cooperating, but if you'll ever cheat me, I'll cheat you back until the end of time. And then the detective, first I'll analyze you. I start cooperate, cheat, cooperate, cooperate. And if you cheat back, I'll act, act like a copycat. If you never cheat back, I'll act like always cheat. Huh. Okay. So how, how, what happens when they go against each other? You can go and you can play with this. There's lots of interesting stuff over here. But this is, for me, the ultimate uh, game, game theory uh, simulation. So I've, I went, I, I, just to show you how far this goes, now let's our population of players evolve over time. Here's a three-step dance. Player tournament, eliminate the losers, reproduce the winners. So you can see the ecology of this and what happens in society when you have different players, which is amazing. I've never seen this kind of thing before. I've seen academic papers on this, but I've never seen like a really nice uh, simulation. And then repeating things. So say that we start with the following populations of 15 always co cooperate, five cheat, copycats, and all this. What is the right bet on who is going to win? So among these three, all cooperate, all cheat, and copycat, who's going to win? Uh, copycat. Sorry? Copycat. copycat, yeah. So yeah, copycat did not win, <laughs> but at least they didn't do as badly as always cooperate. They got eaten by the always cheat. Isn't that a sad reflection of reality? <laughs> <laughs> always cheat still keeps growing at the expense of always cooperate and now the always cooperates are dead that's right the always cheats becomes the victim of their own success and they exploited they're always cooperative but once they ran out of them they had to face uh, copycats which are not naive but simply copying the other persons finally you're correct copycats inherit the earth so it's really interesting to see this kind of thing and then they introduce the grudger and the detectives so uh, we keep going. It, the, the, there's a copy kitten, there's a simpleton, and there's a randomizer that we somebody uh, said before. So really interesting stuff. The last thing that we have, yeah, just in time, is the value uh, of trust. So I'm going to show you, uh, Dan Ariely, discuss uh, trust a little bit, how to increase trust.
I trust my friend, let me rat on them as well. And often what you have is that both people rat, each of them get five years, but if they could only trust each other, life will be better. Now, this is the basic game, and now imagine two versions of this game. In version one, people make a decision, but the decision is for one game at a time. I play one game with you, then I play another game with somebody else, and there's never building up games. It's one game at a time. In the second version, we play many games with the same person. What's the difference? Here's what happens. In terms of results, when we play with strangers, most people rat most of the time, right? Not ideal, but that's what people do. When we play with people the same over and over and over, we, co we cooperate much more. We remain silent much more. But this is not the end of the story. When you think about how these things progress over time, there are kind of two periods. When people know that they're going to play with the same person over time, they start by cooperating much, much more. But as they get toward the end of the period, they stop cooperating. You see, in the beginning, we have time to build our reputation, to build a long-term game. But as we get to the end, it's as if we're playing the one period game. So we actually have these two periods, and the effect is much, much larger in the beginning, as we build long-term relationships and as we build reputation. So we start by cooperating, and then sadly, as the relationship comes to an end, we start defecting. As an analogy for this, you can think about marriage. You start very happy, you cooperate, then you say, we're going to end this thing, and you start being nasty to each other. So how can we increase trust? Two lessons are it's about long-term relationships, and it's about building reputation. OK, so that's pretty good. Um, travel dilemma we really don't have time for. And the last part I'm going to, I just want to show you um, that prisoner's dilemma, this the, the demonstration here, the prisoner's dilemma is actually a part of the traveler's dilemma. So you can go and have a look at traveler's dilemma. But basically, it's prisoner's dilemma here, two by two. A traveler's dilemma is just like multiply this by 99 and get from two, two to 100. And then you have a very, very large set of considerations of what to do. And then it's really interesting to see what the Nash equilibrium is uh, for that. Finally, I'll show this in the beginning of the next class about uh, Dan Ariely and the value of trust. So that's kind of summarizes the issues of trust and game theory. Ho hope that you got the, the basics of how to model these kind of things, the kind of academic articles that you can write about uh, TV shows or about prisoners and how they do prisoners' dilemmas. So a lot of things that you can take away from this. It's not uh, all uh, kind of experiments. There's other ways of doing research. Lots of interesting ideas of how to take something as simple as game theory, trust game, dictator game, and take this into real life and experiments and interesting insights about mankind, trust cooperation. If you have any questions and you want to talk more, I'm going to stay here for five, five more minutes.